Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, whatever time you're watching this. Uh, with Father Sergio and Father Francis, we wish you a happy and blessed Holy Week. And uh, we're going to share with you what is a custom here in the States, the three ore, the three hours. Uh, of course, we're not going to preach three hours. I can't do that. But uh, it's talking about the last seven words of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. It's his last testimony and, and all his mission. I re remember when I came in 1993, the United States, I was in Brooklyn, New York, and Father Martin Aubrey and myself were invited to share the seven words. And uh, we said, we have to talk for three hours? So we divide an hour and a half each. And uh, so we have to do a research. Of course, we were famous, the last seven words of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. But this time, uh, we divided the words between Father Sergio, Father Francis, and myself. And, and I chose the first two words, uh, which are the first one is Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And the second word of Jesus is today you will be with me in paradise. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And Jesus, his whole life was talking about forgiveness, mercy. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. And, and forgiveness is something that he practiced in his life. He taught us when he taught us the prodigal son, when he taught us when uh, this woman caught in adultery was brought to him they wanted to stone her and nobody condemned her and jesus says i don't condemn you either but forgiveness forgive them because they do not know what they are doing forgiveness is an easy word we have to forgive but it's easy to talk about forgiveness but i think it's the most difficult word to put into practice in our lives and she, Jesus is forgiving the people who are crucifying him. For us, that we are human beings, we are not perfect. Uh, forgiveness is so tough because we always uh, say, how can I forgive the person who offended me? How can I forgive the person who disrespected me? And uh, the person who hurt me? The person who hates me. Naturally, it's impossible. Our human nature gets in the way. And Jesus says, be merciful. Pray for those who do wrong things to you. Be merciful like your heavenly Father is merciful, who makes rain or, or the sunshine in the good and the bad. And, and we have to be like God our Father. And, and uh, for that, we need God's grace. Only supernaturally, with God's grace, we can forgive. It requires a lot of faith. God's grace, strength, I think lots of communion, participating in the Eucharist. When we consecrate the bread and wine, the chalice for the forgiveness of sins, we have to be able to forgive the person who offend us. And that's a great lesson that Jesus gives us on the cross. Easy to practice? No, it's not. But we need to pray when we pray to our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's hard to forgive because our ego gets in the way. How can you do this to me? Or you did this to me, how can I... So uh, our ego, our human nature, our pride gets in the way. So we have to be humble and recognize how many times God has forgiven us. And for that reason, we have to forgive. And uh, forgiveness brings peace, 
the person who forgives brings peace to the person who is forgiven. When we don't forgive, it's like we are loaded with something heavy. And when we say, I forgive you, that heavy thing is lifted from our shoulder. And when Jesus says, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing, that heavy load is lifted from our shoulders too. Because Jesus forgives us. And uh, also forgiveness brings healing in relationships. And uh, it's not going to be automatically, but it begins to heal the wounds of our souls and begins to heal relationships. And uh, brings that peace. I don't know if you remember the time that probably you went to confession, anxious and nervous. I do remember anxious and nervous. What's Father going to say? I've been so bad. Can he forgive me? And when Father gives you the absolution and says, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. I feel like a feather, like floating in the air. That peace and lightness that we receive from the forgiveness from God. So this Good Friday, as we see Jesus dying on the cross and forgiving us from his heart, we have to be like the prodigal son going back to him because he for sure will forgive us. And like that woman caught in adultery, how she might have felt after being forgiven by Jesus. Woman, has anybody condemned you? No, sir. Nobody has condemned you, neither do I. Go and sin no more. So let's pray that this Holy Week, when we come to celebrate the passion of our Lord, we will remember these words. Jesus not only spoke about forgiveness, He forgave us. And He forgives us all the time. May we be forgiven like Him and merciful like our Heavenly Father. Good morning, everyone. As we continue with the last seven words of Jesus on the cross, I would like to start something that I skipped in my first words. Say a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle the fire of love in the heart of your faithful. Give us, Lord, send your Holy Spirit, and everything will be renewed, and you shall recreate, you shall renew the face of the earth. May the Holy Spirit come upon each one of us and fill us with the love of Jesus who gave his life for us on the cross. The second word that Jesus pronounced on the cross was, Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And uh, I think it's related to the forgiveness that Jesus brings to us, the first word. But this in particular case, a criminal dying on the cross recognizes Jesus as Lord, as a king, and asks for forgiveness. This is what prompted Jesus to say these words. I mean, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So that thief was such a good thief that in the last moment of his life, stole heaven, stole a place in paradise, stole Jesus' heart. First of all, he recognized that he was suffering because of his crimes. When the other thief was asking Jesus, if you are the son of God, save us, uh, save yourself and save us. The good thief was telling him, we are paying for our crimes, but this man has done nothing wrong. He recognized that Jesus was innocent and he recognized his guilt, his uh, failure, his crime, and he confessed that. So he acknowledged that he was a sinful person and he asked for forgiveness. So first of all, he recognized Jesus and called him Lord. Jesus didn't have any appearance, as the scripture says. He didn't look even like a man. All 
uh, he didn't look like a king or a lord, but he called him Lord. He acknowledged his sins, his crimes. He acknowledges Jesus as Lord and, uh, and Savior. And uh, that's why he confessed. Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And uh, to be able to say those words, he needed God's grace. It's like when, when you raise your children, you give them the same, but they react in different ways. Here you have two thieves. One, they were suffering the same punishment, but one didn't accept Jesus. He was uh, complaining and shouting and screaming. And this one was acknowledge his sins, ask for forgiveness, and, and recognize Jesus Lord and Savior, God's grace touched his heart. Suffering these times of coronavirus, of aching, pain, anxiety, we can react in one way, like the bad thief, or we can react like the good thief, acknowledge God's power, God's love, that we will overcome this with God's grace. But we need to allow that grace to come into our hearts that will enable us to say those words. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So I pray that when uh, the Lord comes our way, the cross comes our way, and when probably we are near death, suffering, we pray for perseverance in our faith, in our love for our Lord Jesus Christ, and to be able to accept God's grace and recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior and say those words, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So we can be able to listen to Jesus' words, today you will be with me in paradise. So I invite all of you to say this prayer. Not only at the moment of our death, but every day in our life. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let's not wait until the last minute of our life. Just every day say this prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. And maybe we can steal Jesus' heart, or we can steal a place in paradise. We can be like that good thief and pray for that perseverance knowing and trusting that God will forgive us and give us a place in paradise. So let us acknowledge that Jesus our Lord and Savior, knowing that his love is always at hand. May God bless you. The third word that we are supposed to meditate is are the words of Jesus Christ to his mother and to John, the disciple whom he loved. The words are, uh, woman, here is your son, um, and to him he said, here is your mother. John, he is done uh, by Jesus Christ, representing all of us. In that way, uh, Jesus Christ gives us the most Beside to give his most precious gift to us in his life, he gave to us uh, the most precious gift that he had was uh, still his mother. She is now from that moment on our mother, and we supposed to be uh, her sons. And we become more and more uh, her sons in the way that we become more similar to Jesus Christ. There is no more wonderful love in the world than the love that the mother had for their sons and that the love that we have for our mothers. I believe that the, in heaven is a special place for, for all the mothers. But uh, how wonderful is that love that not only Jesus Christ wants to share that love like all of us, 
but he wants for us to have the most beautiful woman and the most beautiful mother in the world that he had to share with us. That is why in our Catholic tradition, our devotion to the Blessed Mother is, is, is great and it's one of the most uh, distinctive things of our faith. The prayers that we do, uh, the rosary, is one of the things that, you know, differentiate us from all the other religions. The devotion that we have to Mary is, is not because uh, we don't love Jesus Christ. It's because we love him and we remember the word that he said that here is our mother. For all of us who are Catholic, for all of us who, who have a devotion to the Blessed Mother, uh, this third word is very important. She's just not the mother of Jesus. She is our mother. San, uh, San Luis Gonzaga once was, uh, he has a great devotion to the Blessed Mother. And when he was in the seminary, he was walking through, uh, always passing the, the image of the, of the Blessed Mother. And he always was saying to her, show herself as a mother many times until one day the Blessed Mother talked back to him and said, but you show yourself as a son. As we pray to our Blessed Mother, have we remembered that she is our mother? We need also to commit ourselves to be her sons. Not just because we have our, our baptized, but especially because our life as believers consists in to imitate more and more our Lord Jesus Christ. More we imitate him, more similar to we become to the one who is the firstborn of the Blessed Mother, our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Blessed Mother then help us to remember uh, her son always. She will take each one of us and shape each one of us according to the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. May our Blessed Mother pray for us. Amen. We now go to the fourth um, set of words that Jesus spoke during his final um, moments on earth. The fourth word, words were, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dear friends, do you sometimes feel forsaken by God? We probably can say that all of us have felt struggles, frustrations, or um, sort of um, crosses to carry in our lives. It was also at this moment when Jesus on the cross authored these words. These are words of surrender, of frustration, words of giving up. Because after going through those moments of persecution and abandonment, Jesus felt that his father has forsaken him. And again in our life, who among of us have not felt the same way? going through difficult times and tough times. You would also understandably see Jesus and understand him why he felt forsaken and why he felt abandoned by his father. But did God really abandon Jesus when he was gasping and dying on the cross? Really, does our God really abandon us when we are at the lowest points of our lives? God did not abandon Jesus. God was with Jesus all the way. God was strengthening Jesus when he was at the lowest point in our, his life. We, of course, we are humans. We're subject to struggles and difficulties and human frailties. It is understandable to sometimes feel in our lives that we are forsaken by God. But truth be told, God really, his presence in our lives is the strongest when we feel that this world is forsaking us or or God is forsaking us his presence is even more stronger when we feel that you know we are going through tough times in this moment of our lives dear friends we are going through a difficult time as well we are aware all of us are aware that many of our families individuals are losing jobs because of the current situation and we can probably feel that we 
are on the cross and we feel that where is God in the midst of this? In the midst of this pandemic and epidemic, we probably will ask, is God forsaking us because we are going through these illnesses? But really, God will never abandon us. He probably allows these things to happen, but He is there in our midst. He's reminding us to cling to Him. He's reminding us, like Jesus, He was having a conversation with His Father, asking the question, God, are you forsaking us? But let us hold on to the truth that God will never abandon us. God will never abandon us because He is there to strengthen us. Therefore, we always have to cling to Him. We always have to hang on to the truth that He will never abandon us and that He is always there for us. Dear friends, do you sometimes feel that God has forsaken you? The fifth set of words that Jesus uttered in his final moments of his life were the words, I thirst. Was it physical thirst that Christ was longing for when he said, I thirst? Yes, in his humanity, physical thirst is something very important. But the truth is that Christ was thirsting, not really physical thirst, but he was thirsting for those people who were formerly with him those people who he worked with during his ministry, healing ministry, teaching ministry. These are the people who were with Jesus. And dying on the cross, perhaps, he was uttering these words because he was longing for his followers, his apostles, who were with him during you know, the times of, of ministry. It is in the lowest episode of our, our lives that we would also long for people, people who are for us, and sometimes we experience people who are not there for us. Those who are for us would always remain in our lives no matter what. And those who are not would immediately leave when you know, the, the, the times get tough. I would always advise young people when they come to me for, for help that they would always need to, to hang on in life with their families. They would always um, seek their, their parents' advice and stick to them no matter what. Because many times our friends come and go. And many of our friends sometimes would always be there with us during the, the joys, the success. But sometimes during the difficult times, we sometimes don't see our friends. But our family members would always be there for us no matter what. There's a saying, we can choose our friends, but we cannot choose our family. Friends, when we encounter these words, I thirst, let us imagine Jesus addressing those words to us. I thirst for you to be faithful in your relationship. I thirst for you to be faithful to me, to pray, to attend Mass, even in today's time, online or through video and through live streaming. Jesus is telling us, I thirst for you to value the sacredness of life, to value, you know, the, the teachings of the church. I thirst for you to be present to your family, to be a good father, to be a good mother, to be a good son and daughter to your parents. I thirst for you to be faithful to your priesthood. I thirst for you to be faithful to your vows. Your friends, what will you respond to Jesus when he asks, you. I thirst for you. Amen. The six set of words that Jesus uttered during his final moments were the words, it is finished. How do you normally feel when you have accomplished something that is worth doing? Do you feel good? Do you feel triumphant? 
the second to the last words that Jesus said were words, it is finished. These are words of triumph. These are words of accomplishment. Jesus finally defeated Satan, who was whispering to him to finish his salvific mission, not to finish his mission. These were the words um, that Jesus ad uttered because he finally had overcome those hurdles, those temptations to pursue you know, his end, which is to redeem us. Jesus finally redeemed the sinful humanity from the enslavement of sin. However, it is not yet finished for us, dear friends. We are still in the, this journey called life. And while we're, we're still journeying in this life, we still have to battle the many demons that come our way, the temptations, the hurdles for us to be a faithful disciple of God. We did not give, we cannot give a space for the devil to work in our hearts so that um, you know, we can continue to become a faithful follower of Jesus. Dear friends, in your life, would you be able to say, it is finished? Would you be able to say at the end of your life, when the sun sets in our life, will we be able to truly say, to confidently say, it is finished? It is only in the moment when we can say it is finished if we have been faithful to the Lord, which is what He calls us to be faithful in our ministries, faithful in our vows, faithful in our relationships and our roles as uh, family members, as a father, as a daughter, and even as a friend to um, the people we live with. Dear friends, may we be able to say it is finished when that time comes for us, and we can only do so when we are faithful to the Lord as His disciples. The last word of Jesus Christ that we meditate is uh, the word of Jesus Christ. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We always say that we die in the way we live. If we live always putting our life in the hands of God, we will die in that way. But what a beautiful way to, to finish everything, to to put ourselves, not only while we are living here in this world to be in the hands of God, but how we pass from this world to the next world. Put ourselves always in the hands of God. There is, there is no place and where we can be safer than in the hands of God. One of the, the biggest problems that we have as a, as a human being is that we, we trust ourselves. We, we believe that we can achieve many things, and we do. But sometimes we need also to understand that we, know we need to put our faith and our trust in the Lord. We are in His hands. We as sons and daughters, we are in the hands of our Father. As we live in this world, we, and we, when we die, we give back to the Lord the life that we have received. And into His hands, uh, we put our spirit. We need to, to Jesus Christ and the, and dying on the cross, He teaches us everything. He teaches us the way to die. He te teaches us the way we're supposed to live as well. As He referred to His Father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He is teaching us trying to teach us that God is always with us. He's always, you know, taking care of us. And we need to realize that from our part, we need to put all our life in the hands of the Lord. There is no place we can be safer. There is no hands that can be stronger in order to take care of us. We pray always the, the, the Our Father. We always call Him Father when we do the sign of the cross and we will receive the blessing. But also, 
need to understand that our relationship with him as a father is to trust him and to put his sons and daughters all our life, everything that we do, in his hands. And one day, when the moment arrived for us to come from this world to the next world, we will say the same words like Jesus Christ said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. May God bless you.